Hello, podcasters. Welcome to season six, episode ten of Jeff's Podcast Academy, and we are actually on the final episode of the season. In today's episode, we have with us Mr. Andy. So, Mr. Andy is the CEO of Daydreamer Media, a production company focused on changing the future of online storytelling by empowering voices of all kinds. Uh, he's actually a long-time entrepreneur and a startup investor. Uh, Mr. Andy coaches young businesses owner and business owners. with consumer goods brands when he is not out on the set or in the studio working on podcast video projects or live events so mr randy like i said before uh, you know before the actual recording it's an honor to have you here so please tell a little bit about how your journey started in the field of podcasting sure thanks so much for having me i started podcasting a couple of years ago i did a couple short projects where i did like a 10 episode little string just to try something out. Mm-hmm. And I never really got super hooked on it just because I didn't quite have the right topic or I was really busy with my other businesses. Mm. But last year during the pandemic or shortly before it, I had recently relocated to Colorado. I'm from Washington state in Seattle and I didn't know anyone here. And so I started a podcast called Colorado Preneurs uh, mm-hmm. where I interviewed local business owners and I really used it just to to meet people, make some friends, do some networking. And it really caught on and went very well. Mm-hmm. And uh I own a marketing agency and we work with a lot of local companies. So one of my employees came to me and asked if she could become the producer of the podcast. And at that point it was just something that I was doing as a hobby. Mhm. and i've got a background in advertising and i've done a little bit of broadcast stuff but altogether podcasting is a very competitive market and yeah. it's something that professionally is difficult to get into mm-hmm. so i hadn't really thought about it but we started taking on some clients that we were producing podcasts for and one became two two became four now we have over 30 that we produce mm-hmm. so we have a and it's been more deliberate than that it's been about a year of planning yeah. and we've we've subsidized that with uh some traditional book publishing some video channels mm-hmm. some online news sites mm-hmm. helping people develop online courses so we're doing a lot of all encompassing publishing media brands mm. as podcasting is really the spearhead for us okay. but we have a public facing network much like the big networks in the US the the big ones are Barstool Sports, Wondery, Gimlet, Parcast, uh The Ringer, mm-hmm. all of those have been bought up by Amazon or Spotify in the past year. Mm-hmm. And so we have about 20 shows that we own and produce mm-hmm. and we employ people to make and then we probably have another 10 or 15 that we make for people that pay us to make them. and those aren't published publicly published under our banners but uh so we have daydreamer network is the public facing network daydreamer studios is the the full production business our studio here in denver some of our team in seattle and then we have uh daydreamer marketing which offers marketing services to content creators we were doing so many websites and social media accounts for all of the podcasts that we own we decided to start offering those services for other people so in the markets where we have access to people in person we do video and photography and several other things so at the moment we've got podcast hosts in i think probably 15 US states and we just recruited our first one from the UK mm-hmm. and uh we're hoping to continue growing and uh building a portfolio of diverse voices and kind of going at things a little bit differently Well, and I I think uh so just to summarize what you're doing so you actually started as a marketing agency and you actually helped podcasters and you also used the podcasting field to upsell your marketing services as well so it's kind of like a round and on like full on service and you produce you actually give video services uh you know photos as well so it's like a full on digital agency like everything literally you are providing if i'm being correct yeah we really wanted to with our network no matter what you're doing if you're doing a blog or a youtube or a podcast 
it can take a long time to cultivate an audience. Yeah. And so we set out to the prospect of starting 25 podcasts at once from scratch is very difficult Mm -hmm. because unless you are a celebrity or you have a huge social media following, there have been professional athletes that have done well, but you can't will an audience into existence. So it takes a long time to grow. And that's why Mm -hmm. there aren't very many podcast networks Mm -hmm. because people don't want to subsidize it for a year or two and pay the staff while you're growing enough following to get the traditional advertising and sponsorship Mm. monies. And so what we did was my agency does a lot of product development. Mm. And in most podcasts, your goal is to grow an audience for a couple of years, maybe sell a couple ads on your website, maybe get some live reads on your show. But then eventually you want to have some kind of course or some kind of product merchandise. A lot of people do Patreon. So what we did was kind of flip the script. We teamed with a lot of people that were already coaches in real life or had some kind of product to sell or were authors. And we immediately started booking them in-person event speaking opportunities. And we're publishing a handful of books this year that are going to be in bookstores. And we started producing video and we're offering coaching in all these different uh, industries. So we picked people that would be not just great hosts of podcasts and content creators from a journalistic standpoint, but people that will be good ambassadors for our portfolio and those that are ready to grow a brand and a business on their own. And so many of the people that are hosts on our platform are self-employed business owners in their own right. And we're doing this as a supplement or as a standalone venture for them. And then the other thing is, we set out to really be a lifestyle portfolio. So instead of the things that we stay away from are politics, religion, and sports, because first of all, we don't want, uh, we're positive vibes only kind of thing. We don't want anything that's polarizingly aggressive. And in our country, those are kind of hot topics and sports is so competitive. We don't want four guys sitting around talking about soccer because yeah. there's thousands of those. Yeah. So we set out to do, we have lots of business coaches. We have a lot of yoga and spirituality and natural health kind of people, parenting, relationships, music, art. So we, we've got a lot of really talented folks and we started out not with money in mind. We started our first 10 or 15 shows and we sought out people that had a really unique voice and maybe otherwise wouldn't have been able to share their stories. Maybe they don't have the technology or the technical know-how, the resources. We found academics and students, and we did scholarships and an incubator program. And it's been really great because we set out to kind of be in categories that were much more niche. So I use the example a lot. We had a guy for a while that was doing a show about basketball. But he was an expert in basketball sneakers. And so he would talk about the shoes and what players were wearing the shoes and the endorsement deals. And over half the episode would just be talking about the basketball games like every other basketball podcast. But instead of being the number 500 basketball podcast, we were like one of the only ones that was focused on shoes. Hmm. So we were able to kind of hack the algorithm with some of the shows that we created to start all together with a uh, pretty unique stuff. So now we're in a cycle in our startup where we are going to larger businesses, some former reality TV people, some athletes, we're bringing on kind of the official wave and the varsity team to take to the next level because uh, we do want to grow and yeah. we hopefully, <laughs> hopefully Spotify comes calling us in a couple of years. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really hope they do. And, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned like, you know, you guys were managing around, around 30 podcasts. So I was having, I was just talking with this one guy in my, you know, in my state where he actually started a podcast network, just like you, you know, he actually helps people produce the shows. Uh, he managed around 15. So it was around, I think, uh, four to five months. So the, the latest uh, time when I talked to him, he said that we are actually down to three shows right now, like 
all of these other shows they mention that you know like they are not consistent or you know they are not doing properly with all stuff i mean like so do you have any particular criteria because you said that you do with business coaches because you are really exact correct because even though people with passion and everything can do still uh people actually with an end goal works way better than the people with the actual passion so how, how do you you know make those people consistent like what do you do do you have any criteria for that anything as such from a business perspective mm-hmm. in being on the as the network and i'm sure your friend will completely identify with this it's difficult because there are a very small proportion of people that get paid a full time salary to be a podcaster mm-hmm. yeah and so it's very difficult because if you are a media network and you own a sports show talking about rugby or cricket or something close to where you live uh if one of the anchors leaves and retires you can just hire another one like you own the show Mm -hmm. but in podcasting when you're doing a portfolio as a network the host more often than not own their show i can't afford to pay someone a salary because i don't know if their show is going to work out Mm -hmm. so we sign a couple year contract. And if they see their contract through, uh, they own their intellectual property. And mm-hmm. this very famously recently happened uh, in our country with Barstool Sports, which is a big culture brand. Mm-hmm. They have one of the largest podcasts on the internet called Call Her Daddy. It's a dating show. Okay. And there's been a lot of drama with the, with the hosts of it. One of them left about a year ago. They were trying to close a bigger deal. And there was this big to-do about she got offered a million dollar contract to be a podcaster. Hmm. And that's a lot of money for someone who was doing YouTube two years ago. But the minute that her contract expired, she left and she just signed a $60 million contract with Spotify. So at some point as a network, you are as a business partner starting to build something with someone. Hmm. But as, as your friend suggested, there is a lot of attrition. People, decide they don't make it, they run out of ideas, they think it sounds like a great thing to begin with. Mm -hmm. So when I teach podcasting, to me, there are really three different types of people that get into podcasting. The first one is people that want to be a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. So we're living in an era where the radio is dying. People that were formerly a radio host, it's getting difficult. And TV anchors, they don't pay salaries to those people with all the experience that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. You used to have to spend most of your career to get up to being on the anchor desk. And now you'll see people in their 20s that are on the news or on a sports channel. And they're cheaper, they're easier, they're willing to move around, and Mm -hmm. there's a lot of competition. So for people that want to be a broadcaster, usually they get into podcasting as some kind of supplement to their portfolio. So if they're trying to get a better job in their day life, or they're trying to keep their experience relevant. They're mostly focused on them. I want this to be the Jeff show. I want people to get to know Jeff. I want you to know my face. I want to be the character. And these people are more often than not most focused on the total number of reach that they have. They want the most people to see their face. So they're maybe not super focused on it making money. They're maybe not super focused on converting sales because they're broadcasting for the sake of broadcasting. Now, the second group are the business folks. So these people might be a coach in real life. They might be a fitness trainer. I have a a host on our network that is a professional matchmaker. And so she does in-person matchmaking for people uh, that are looking for love. And so she doesn't really care how much total reach her show has, because if she puts out an episode and only a couple hundred people listen to it, but three of them hire her as a client offline. They're paying thousands of dollars. This happens so, on a podcast itself. Like she does that. Well, she's not doing sales on the podcast, oh. <laughs> but okay. she, from uh, the podcast, she okay. gets a lot of leads. Yeah. So she tells her existing clients, go listen to my podcast because it has useful lessons. Mm-hmm. And she tells people that find the podcast, reach out to me afterwards, give me a phone call and sign up for my service. Hmm. So people that have a online course or people that have an in-person service like that, it's, it's extremely valuable. And so they're not worried about the overall reach. They're worried about conversions. So they want to make sure that a very good and very qualified amount of people see their stuff. It doesn't matter about the total number. It matters about the quality. Mm -hmm. And then the third group are the people who want to build a brand. 
So they might not be specifically interested in broadcasting or in business, but they think podcasting is a trend. I maybe I've been a blogger in the past. Maybe I've been a YouTuber. Maybe I just want to do this because I'm good at SEO or web optimization. And I know that this is a growing industry where I can create a following and cultivate an audience right now that I could use for other stuff. So these people want the podcast to be a business. Mm -hmm. So they want to have advertising on it. They want to sell sponsorships. And they're mostly going to be focused on the metrics then because they want to get downloads so they can turn around and have a media kit to, mm -hmm. to garner advertising revenues. So person number one, the broadcaster is saying, look at me, look at me, look at me during their content. Yeah. Person number two is saying, go to my website, buy stuff, go to my yeah. website, reach me offline. And then person number three is saying, go buy this toaster on Amazon because I'm getting an affiliate commission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it just depends what the person's motivation is. And I think person number one, uh, we've had a couple of those and their lifestyle changed during COVID. Maybe they had to get a different job. Maybe they weren't able to pursue the thing that they were doing at that point. And there's just a lot of emotional things that have happened. So some of those people uh, flame out and walk away after a few months. And then the ones that want to build it as a business, some of them have realized, well, there have been over a million podcasts globally started in the last 12 months. This is really competitive. And they say, oh, crap, now that I've gotten started, it might take me a couple years to make this thing where it could it could make revenue. And so they they aren't patient enough. So I like to do the number two person, the <laughs> business person, because they aren't they use this as a tool for what they're already doing. So they're qualified, they have stuff to sell, they have an existing following, and it's, it's just plus plus value for them because they don't have expectations. Yeah, I, th I think you make a valid point there, actually. And, you know, interestingly, uh, before going into the actual discussion on, you know, the topics which we uh, talked about, I just want to have one follow up question. So which one do you think is actually the easiest? Like you mentioned three personas here right now. So uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is that some people who come to me, they're always the first thing they will ask is, uh, like, you know, uh, do you think sh we should actually go for uh, what to say sponsorship? That's the first thing that comes to mind. People, I mean, like you require a large number of following for the particular sponsorships. I mean, like people don't, uh, you know, even though the knowledge of what the content you deliver is one thing, but the way we speak, uh, the way we deliver under AC and all stuff, it's also matters for the brand building. So what do you think is easiest according to your perspective uh, and the three personas which you mentioned? I think it does depend a little bit on the kind of content that you're in. Mm -hmm. If you are talking about uh, American football, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that do that. Mm -hmm. And it can be very difficult to be found. And you have to have a lot of expertise and you have to have other stuff. So depending on what you do in social media or in your career, if you're offering a sponsorship on your podcast, there's a lot of things you can do that go beyond the, the podcast itself. Yeah. So the first thing that I always say is make the most professional content you can edit, mm -hmm. edit. If you need to wait a little while or do it in seasons or split it up and do two a month instead of one a week for a little while, the more professional quality content you create, mm -hmm. people do when they listen, they don't know whether you have a million followers or just your grandma. So like nobody's going to be able to tell the only people yeah. that are going to ask are people that are going to be giving you money for sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sell a sponsorship in the early days and you don't have a ton of following yet, you can say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a live read ad on my podcast and I'm going to talk about your service. I'm going to put a link in the show notes I will put an ad on my website. I will mention you uh, several times on my social media. I'll publish stories and become an affiliate. Uh, some people will change the art of their podcast cover for the month. And they'll put a little ribbon on the bottom that has the logo that says presented by. Wow. So if you can come up with a bunch of multi-channel stuff that you're going to provide, it's very difficult to do a cumulative metric from that. Yeah. So they aren't going to say exactly how many people are going to see this they're going to say, wow, you're doing a lot of things for me. The only kind of uh, drawback to that is more often than not, they'll make a page on their website mm -hmm. that says gillettshavers.com backslash Jeff. And they'll see how many people come to their website from your link. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think it's, uh, I think the, the person with broadcasting background probably has some connections. I think maybe that first person mm-hmm. has the most likelihood to have a great voice, to be able to access guests. Long term, I believe in building brands. And I think the strongest person to build a brand with is the number two, the business person. Mm-hmm. because the the number three person might be dedicated but you have no idea what their topic is yeah and in downloads globally there's a huge movement right now like 25 percent of podcasts are in the uh true crime and scripted mm-hmm. drama space so that takes a lot of work like there's a ton of journal there's a ton of research behind that yeah. or people are writing Uh, horror stories it's just like scary movies people love that stuff and so that is a space that is really tuned to grow quickly whereas i would say sports and politics maybe will grow the slowest if you don't have a pre-existing following Mm -hmm. so the healthy medium is community-based stuff if you are teaching meditation classes or you're talking to people about yoga or you're talking to people about small business or mental health people everyone is interested in those things and so even if it's competitive those are way easier areas where you don't really need to qualify that you're a professional psychologist to interview people about mental health and their experience in life and you don't have to be a professional broadcaster uh to be able to just do the human connection so i think the lifestyle podcasts like what we do if you're starting out those are the kind of topics that are most tuned to succeed uh quickly if that's what your goal is but it's really interesting with the the crime and drama stuff because we're talking about like the 1950s when there were no tvs and people were huddled around the radio listening to their weekly stories you know like people look forward to the new episode coming out because they're listening to pretty much an an audio book that's split up over 12 weeks and so it's very very uh just fascinating that people have been able to do this episodic storytelling stuff. And there is a company uh, out of California called Parcast. And it was a student that graduated from Stanford a couple of years ago. And he and his dad started uh, doing these scripted drama things. There was a big show called Serial that was very, very popular. Uh, And they have, I think, 25, 30 shows that were all these sci-fi horror scripted narrated drama and true crime researchers and they sold their company to spotify last year for i think 150 million dollars after two years of building it from scratch and it was just a father's son they raised some money i think they had some capital but uh that's pretty amazing to do it in just one category (laughs) well that's entirely true and you know i actually i i Actually, we had a lot of questions to ask from that. But, Please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and actually, we want to t- touch up on this thing because, you know, you mentioned a lot of times about, you know, Spotify, you know, buying and Amazon actually buying it. Uh, I'm just curious because Spotify is one of the platforms where, you know, uh, it's now acquiring a lot of, uh, you know, podcasts. Like, I think the first big deal they did was the Joe Rogan. At least that's the only thing that actually changed the entire landscape of how people actually viewing the podcast. So, First is, why do you want for Spotify to be acquired? I mean, like, don't you want to become a competitor for Spotify like by acquiring someone else's you know, network? I mean, like, what's so interesting on Spotify acquiring it? I mean, like, won't it become a monopoly or you know, them or the Amazon? Well, we live in a culture right now where the startup is heralded. These yeah. Silicon Valley technology people that raise venture capital Mm -hmm. and eventually are going to get bought out by Mm -hmm. some billionaire. That's kind of what people think entrepreneurism is. Like Mm -hmm. you plan your exit. You don't want to open a restaurant or a brewery and have your kids inherited and own it for 50 years. People think about what's at the end. And I think a little bit about that. I think about is podcasting going to get too saturated? Is it going to stop being cool at some point? And very few people are able to make a living podcasting or very few people are able to get to this size. And the same thing happens with YouTube. Mm -hmm. Very few people get big enough where they can make significant money from it. So it takes quite a while. And 
for me, this business, we've kind of just been riding the wave. I didn't start this on purpose. You know, <laughs> it just kind of people liked it. And we saw the podcast movement happening. But the big issue right now is those top seven or eight companies that I mentioned, mm -hmm. all of them are worth between 200 and 400 million US dollars. Oh. And after that, there's this quantum leap to like one or two million. Hmm. Like the difference between us and the next bigger one is, is $150 million. Well, that math makes it sound like we're bigger, but it's, a, <laughs> you know, 200 ish. Yeah. There's a couple smaller ones. And there's companies like NPR that have hmm. uh, other endeavors, but their podcasting studio is pretty successful. But there's these massive companies, and then there aren't because people aren't able to start podcasts fresh and make money from them. And maybe I can bring in several existing podcasts that already have a following, but then the contracts get thinner and thinner on the margin because at that point, I'm not doing their production. They aren't using my team. Maybe we can do some marketing and graphics and products, but largely I'm just brokering advertising for them. Whereas the ones that we start from scratch, we have a stake in them and we own them. So at some point, the intellectual property is very, very important. A lot of these podcast networks will immediately file trademarks and, mm. and copyright everything and buy all the web domains because the only thing that you own is the brand and unfortunately so many brands and podcasting are tied to the person yeah. so that call her daddy example that i made is is a very good one one of the hosts sophia left and went to another network and nobody listens to her now because the show is about alex it's about the one main girl and so she could leave start another thing called by a different name and everyone would follow her because she's the personality and so the problem is these shows get built so much around the host that they aren't interchangeable. You can't just fire that person and bring in another one. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, I really would love to, it, the other thing is you have to go a long time for going, making money. And so our business is doing fine, but I can't say if someone wanted to buy us for, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, I wouldn't bail because <laughs> the world is ever changing and yeah. my company might not be worth anything in 10 years because people might stop listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. But to your point, there is a big thing happening right now where people are signing exclusive contracts. Mm -hmm. So they they buy up these big networks because they want access to that unique programming. So when they bought Parcast, they got all of those horror things and they now own the horror genre and they can put their advertising into those shows and they have avid people that listen to those and a huge audience. Mm -hmm. So Spotify with their podcasting might not have had very many people that were listening to that genre because they weren't offering very many things. They mm -hmm. bought Parcast and they brought in millions of people that listen to true crime. They bought the ringer and they brought in millions of people that listen to sports podcasts. And they all of a sudden had the top several in every one of those categories. So Spotify runs on advertising and they now had access to all those people in the top categories in podcasting and the top shows in those categories. But now you have Brock and Michelle Obama signed a contract to do a couple shows on Spotify, Joe yeah. Rogan, obviously, but most recently there have been several that have signed a contract to where now you can only listen to them so on Spotify yeah. and Apple has responded to that by adding paid podcasting. So there's yeah. a few Stitcher and a few of the other platforms allowed you to charge a subscription before, but not one of the majors. Mm -hmm. And so now people are doing, I'm exclusively on Apple because the medium-sized ones that are still self-run are opting to be Apple exclusive because Apple's allowing them to charge $5 a month. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's risky. I like being on lots. And running so many shows like I do, I have one where a ton of people listen to it on Pandora and they don't listen on Google or Apple or Amazon. And largely most of them, about 60% of downloads happen on Apple devices and Apple apps. But we have some that are just complete anomalies. We have one where the community is really big on Reddit and a lot of our leads come from Reddit. And... Uh, most of those people listen to it on Spotify and not Apple because that's the link that the host uses. Mm -hmm. So 
yes, it's fancy to say we publish on 22 platforms and all those small <laughs> esoteric ones. Yeah. Pod Chaser and Outcast and all these ones. Like I've seen the logo, but I've never even seen their website. But Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, um, Stitcher, Amazon. It's really cool now that uh, Google and Apple and Amazon, you can pretty much tell people you can listen to my podcast on any one of the devices because mm -hmm. you can walk into a room and say, Alexa, Siri, or hey, Google, um, play whatever podcast. And that makes it very convenient for people because people who haven't listened to podcasts before don't think about the fact that you could walk into any room and tell, tell your phone to start playing it without touching anything. Cause they say, I don't have that app or I don't know how to do it or whatever. We actually created our own app. We have an app called daydreamer network. It's on Apple, uh, the Apple app store right now. It's not on Android yet. It's coming soon, but it's just a feed to our top 18 shows and you can play them native on our app. So people that are fans of some of our shows can find the other ones without having to seek them out and figure out how to get to them. So that's been pretty useful. Uh, it's one more app for people to have on their phone, but it also allows us to recruit our tribe of fans. You know, it's really interesting because uh, like when I was you know, here hearing a lot of celebrities, you know, signing it and all of that, this is common notion. Okay. Sometimes you may agree. Sometimes you don't, but there are actually 4 million podcasts out there. You know, there are lots of stats for it, but we all know like when Spotify acquired anchor and it positioned in a way that, you know, anyone can start a podcast with a phone, like there are millions, even I think even 1 million podcasts would be there without any context, I guess. So one of my fears is how it comes is that maybe uh, it will remove all of the shows, you know, where it says, uh, you know, anything which isn't published after 90 days or, you know, anything which isn't published, uh, you know, for 30 days might be removed. But my, my, one of the, my main doubts is that how people differentiate, like, you know, what platform, to actually choose to listen. Is it like the convenience or because Spotify runs ads all the time. Okay. Our Indians, we kind of really, really hate when, you know, the Spotify ads, like, you know, uh, the ads, which says that, you know, uh, like this car sound will be coming on. That's one ad will be there. And right now they've added a few new ads as well. So what makes them decide like what platforms so like convenience or, you know, no number of ads or depending on the local culture, I think, I mean, like even high heart radio, you know, it's kind of famous in one place. So yeah, that any particular difference that has. I think if you probably the first wave is what kind of device you have, okay. because Apple devices and Google Android devices come preloaded with the app already on there. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Most people, as you mentioned, depending on where you live in the world, uh, I heart radio is very big in areas. Uh, in South America, and there's a lot of iHeartRadio access in Africa and Western mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, Spotify is huge because they're from Sweden, right? They're very big in Europe. And, but so people usually have Pandora or Spotify for streaming music, mm -hmm. and they may have a paid membership where they can bypass the ads. Yeah. And so I think either you're loyal to the carrier of what your device is, mm -hmm. or you're loyal to one of those two. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really no telling at this point. And that brings in a lot of trouble with the, the numbers, mm -hmm. because if you go onto your hosting platform, Anchor or SoundCloud or Libsyn or Buzzsprout, the trouble that you have is they can aggregate some of the numbers for you of who's listening to your podcast, but they show you the download numbers mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't understand that there are now three different kinds of playing a podcast. There's someone downloading your show. So I subscribe to your program on whatever my preferred app is. And every week it downloads onto my device, mm -hmm. but a download doesn't necessarily mean that I play that. It just means yeah. it's on my phone. But the other thing is a stream means that I might be logged into Spotify but every week I decide to search Jeff's show and I click it and play it, but I'm not downloading it. Hmm. That's a stream. Hmm. And then there's also a play and a play means that I go to Pandora or Apple, whether it's on a computer or on a phone, but I'm not logged into my account. So, or Google, you can just type into Google, Hey, here's my podcast and just click play and listen to it for a little while. But these tracking mechanisms do not track the streams or the plays. They only track the downloads. 
And so you also don't know. I mean, at one point, Nielsen and these agencies that track radio and TV, they would say, oh, well, if this is playing in an office building, you don't know if 10 people are listening to it at that point. It might be on a it might be on a speaker somewhere. And now it's it's just very difficult to know because your actual amount of people that are listening to your show could be two or three times what your download numbers say. So any of you out there that are trying to sell advertising or sponsorships, really think about that because I encourage you to log into your Apple, um, your Apple Connect, your Apple Publisher account that you have to have in order to have it listed on the Apple App Store because, or on uh, iTunes rather and the Apple Podcast. Because if you look, I'll look at my show on a hosting platform and it'll say that Apple makes up 30 to 40% of of what we're doing. And let's say it has a thousand downloads and Apple makes up 40% of that. So 400, but then you go to that episode on Apple and Apple will give you the native data. And it'll say that I had 1200 plays on Apple. So you're like, Oh, well, Apple only represents 40% of my downloads, but it's, it's more than half of my plays. I had more plays on Apple than my entire downloads on all the platforms. So usually you can kind of uh, you can kind of do a little cross math of saying if 1,200 plays is 40 percent of my show, then I'm going to multiply that and forgive me about the math, but you'll get there. It's somewhere around 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I to answer your question in the longest winded way, I think you've gathered that I'm a little long winded, but <laughs> I passionate and I have a lot to say. The the preferred platform really is what is popular where you live, what kind of phone you've got, and where you listen to music more often than not. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I guess it's uh, correct. And don't worry about the long answer because you actually touched upon <laughs> other questions as well, to be honest, like the insights that I was going to talk about. Uh, but great, that's really great. Uh, so just one uh, curious, have you tried the Spotify green room yet? Not yet. It's... Okay. Uh, I think it's exciting and new. Spotify has also bought several other technology companies yeah. that we're going to start hearing about. Mm -hmm. Their dynamic ad insertion program is going to be very big. They're building a platform that can track those metrics more mm -hmm. accurately. But one of the reasons why so many people have flocked to Anchor is because it's free. Yeah. And at some point, they're going to start charging. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they might say, oh, well, all the ones that are older than 90 days, you're going to have to start paying a premium for, or some of the other platforms do that. Libsyn and SoundCloud and Buzzsprout mm, all do that. Yeah. Uh, if a show's longer than 90 days, you have to have a paid account to keep those old ones. But they might make it difficult to transfer to another company. Like Spotify has so much control at this point mm -hmm. because so many people are going to anchor because it's simple, it's free, and you don't need a lot of technology. Yeah. So I'm a little leery. Uh, for mm -hmm. what it's worth, we host all of our shows on Buzzsprout, oh. and uh, I like that one, but I know a lot of people that uh, that use Anchor, and you can get pretty big and pretty professional with Anchor. Yeah, I, I think uh, if you have a plan, I think it would be great because if you have a plan, if you have content planning and all of that, obviously at some point you will receive money and, you know, you will be able to sustain on Anchor. But, you know, people who are just starting out, like you said, the sport po sports podcast, I think a lot of people must be starting it on Anchor, you know, if it's possible, uh, you know, just to start as a way of testing it. So I think that's where they would flock. I mean, like, I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, I started it as a uh, pot business podcast, but at the end of the uh, show i would ask the question like you know if in case that comes a situation where if it's your girlfriend or your business who would you choose i would ask this question <laughs> because i was so heartbroken at that time heartbroken at that time i just wanted to ask people's you know what's their thoughts of life so i guess yeah i think people actually kind of shift their uh, motive from uh, here to there that's great i talk fast so <laughs> sorry for that no <laughs> this is my things okay so is it morning or evening there it is 11, almost 11 o'clock in the morning. In the morning. Okay. I live in the middle of the country. So we <laughs> end up, uh, we end up with a little bit later than the West coast where I'm used to where, what time is it there? Uh, it's 10, 12 in the night. Yeah. It's exactly 12 hours around to India, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's wrap up with some wisdom then so we can get you to sleep. Actually, the question, the reason I asked was that, uh, so uh, this is a question I always ask out of the box, you know, the recording. So who was actually the last person that you made smile yesterday? 
you know, uh, let me think about that. Yesterday, <laughs> these days are so busy. Uh, I will frequently work at, because of the nature of the pandemic and everything, mm-hmm. thankfully in Colorado, things opened back up very quickly. People here were very careful. Our local government's very responsible. And so we've been able to do restaurants and coffee shops and things uh, for almost a year now. I mean, it, it kind of happened pretty quickly mm-hmm. in limited capacities, very spread out. They had to get different furniture, plexiglass, whatever. But the point I'm getting at is we moved out of our office and our studio and the co-working space that we used. And so all of a sudden, there was a while where I had a full-time employee that worked for me for six months before I met her in person. And that was a weird feeling. But I've been out and about doing the coffee shop thing and brewery thing for months now. Mm -hmm. And I'm a person that's very easily distracted. I'm one of those weird creative types. So I often sit alone in the corner with my headphones. But I work really hard to pay people a compliment. Mm -hmm. And people that you see frequently, I go to the same brewery every day. They're actually one of my clients in my marketing business. And uh, I make sure to notice when people get their hair cut or they get a new tattoo or something. So I think uh, I I made someone smile yesterday uh, by just being one of those people that notices that Mm -hmm. that she she had had some work done on her tattoo. And I noticed her arm because I see it every day. (laughs) So uh, I think it was probably this this gal at the brewery. That's nice. That's really nice. That's a good question. I I (laughs) don't really think about that. Great. I think you can use it on your FSO only. No corporates there. <laughs> so you can use that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, normally people will say like, what book do you often recommend or yeah. give us a gift most often? Or what's the most valuable tip that someone's given you? But I kind of like the uh, think about what you do for other people and the spreading the cheer. I might borrow that. <laughs> cool. That's great. So just one final question before wrapping it up is, uh, so what would you actually give as the best tip Uh, in the whole world, according to you, uh, for a p- fellow podcaster to grow. Now, one disclaimer is that uh, this shouldn't be on the internet and you shouldn't have said this before. Okay, a tip for a podcaster. I yeah. would say, think about guests. Guests mm. are the most important thing. Some people have a solo podcast where they're talking about educational content. But if you want it to grow for any of those three folks that I mentioned, If you want to get exposure, if you want to convert sales in some kind of business, or if you want your podcast to grow, the way to grow is harvesting other people's following. Mm -hmm. So you have me on your show as a guest, and I'm going to tell everyone that I know that I was on this and spread the links and all the things. So then a bunch of my people follow you. Mm -hmm. And the more guests that you have on, the bigger guests you can get and continue the snowball. So if you have a talk style show, or if you have an education style show, I would encourage you to come up with some kind of series where for the next five weeks, I'm going to have on people in this industry uh, because we all want to eventually have some kind of big celebrity or academic or tech person, whatever it is. And guests are important, but guests also give you the opportunity to do the unexpected. You don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what information and knowledge they're going to bring to your audience. So I always think that, uh, you a lot of people want podcasting to be their job and you get into this because you want to have a job that you love and so i think it's really important to start out by making content that you enjoy Mm -hmm. and i enjoy connecting with humans that i don't know and hearing their stories Mm -hmm. and so if you do what you love first i think you have the best foundation to garner that money and stuff down the road but if you start out trying to force feed it immediately Uh, people get turned off because it doesn't seem yeah. genuine. So I guess I kind of gave two answers. Do what you love, share the content that you love and connect with humans that have, you can reach out to anyone around mm-hmm. the planet. You and I are on opposite yeah. sides <laughs> of the globe from each other. Yeah. And we met and a couple days later, we're able to get on and talk mm-hmm. like this. And I've absolutely enjoyed it. So I think do what you like and connect with great people. And that brings the authenticity out where people can understand uh, who you are. People want to connect with you as a person. It doesn't matter how smart you are. There's a thousand other people, a million other people that do the same thing as you. Yeah. So be authentic and think about the guests that you're going to have on. Well, wow. that's really new, actually. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, say different things, but the guest part, it's it's something new that uh, we are hearing in this season. So, Mr. Andy, it's been really great, the conversation is. And uh, is there anything else you want to ask me, like tables turned right now? 
Well, uh, I would be really interested in your season two. I'm honored to be the finale. What has been the most interesting thing you've learned from your guests in season two about this year in podcasting or about what people are doing out there that uh, that maybe the audience hasn't heard or maybe I don't know. You have a lot of experts on. Yeah, so there are a lot of things that one thing I learned is to keep in track of the current news because, you know, before I actually kind of uh, mostly focused on the pre-existing models, like for example, how to bring in guests or, you know, how to do this proper editing and all that stuff. Then I kind of thought something is missing, like some conversations, like something is missing. Then only I, I discovered pod news, uh, then a podcast insights and a lot of websites, which offers these sort of news uh, headlines and all. Then I wondered, I mean, like, this particular event happened so this might reflect in the you know these sort of things so i just you know brought in people like you who would actually get affected because of those situations and who can actually give some reasonable insights on people who are coming on that platform so yeah that's one of the things that i kind of learned like to make sure that i can follow the news i hate news to be honest because uh, i mean like you know people say different things on news but i guess you know this business uh, news i think it has some reasonable things to look after so yeah, that's the one thing I actually kind of learned from it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hardly ever listen to the or the read the podcast industry stuff. That's a really good tip. It's awesome. Excellent. Well, <laughs> thanks for letting me be the I mean, maybe it's just how it timed out, but I'm going to act like I'm so special that you decided for me to be the finale. <laughs> no, uh, to be I'm so glad I get to be the end of season two. Yeah, it's it's been really awesome. Uh, so uh, in case people want to contact you, I mean, like you have tons of things to, uh, so people can contact you. So any, you know, where people can read you personally. And if you have any doubts or services stuff, can you please listen to them? So all of my businesses have the word daydreamer in them. Mm -hmm. So our website is daydreamernetwork.com. Mm -hmm. On Instagram, we are daydreamer network and our app is daydreamer network on Apple. Uh, my handles are daydreampreneur. So mm -hmm. all of my media things have the word preneur as an entrepreneur in them. Yeah. So uh, my social media handle is daydreampreneur. I use Instagram. Uh, my website is relaunching by the time this publishes. It's daydreampreneur.com. And I have a lot of books and coaching courses and things on there. I share a lot of content on the podcast that I'm the host of. So um, I think Daydreamer Network or Daydreampreneur, you can find me and you can find my whole team and all the stuff we make. That's awesome. That's awesome. So guys, you heard it. And uh, so Mr. Randy, thank you so much for hopping onto the show to talk about podcasting and your insights on it as well. So podcasters, that's it. We are wrapping up the show. I have given every link in the description. So please go and check it out, the content relating to the insights. And if you'd like to know more about uh, Jeff's Podcast Academy and learn the nuances in the field of podcasting with experts like this amazing person, you can connect with me on LinkedIn uh, at Jeffrey Bubu DJ or follow the Instagram handle uh, podcast for podcasters or Jeff's Podcast Academy. Thanks again, folks. And I'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Mr. Andy. Thank you.